Okay, we're recording right now. Yeah. Hey, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to the seminar. And um, special thanks to Professor Jason for uh, helping uh, for, for uh, giving this talk today. So uh, my name is Nandish, and uh, I am the chair of, uh, of uh, Santa Clara Valley uh, Cast Chapter, along with Pietro. And uh, we organize uh, events like these uh, to get people together network and um, you know, discuss some next generation ideas. So yeah, the, the, this is one such uh, uh, one such event. We have a few more coming up. Um, I want you to encourage, I, I want to encourage you to please um, uh, join COS, which is fairly easy to do. You can go to IEEE's website and, and join us. It doesn't cost mu much at all. It's uh, between 15 to $20 a year. And the benefits are quite significant. Uh, including like free events like these. Um, we have one more event coming up at ISCOS uh, this year. And then we have a distinguished lecture series in, in May and June. So all of those events are free to access for you um, when, when you are a member. Um, in addition, we have a uh, micro courses, very much like a Coursera, uh, but very specific to COS. So you can get uh, exposure to all of that and plus the tutorials and uh, other sets of uh, technical uh, um, uh, technical documents, uh, which will help you to grow in your career. So yeah, without ado, let me invite Haiming to introduce the speaker and yeah. Good evening, gentlemen. So my name is Haiming. I'm a vice chair of uh, CAS Silicon Valley uh, chapter. My pleasure to introduce to you speaker of today's seminar, Professor Jason Estrogen. Professor Israel is, a, is an assistant professor with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, the University of California, Santa Cruz. He received the Bachelor of Engineering, uh, specializing in electrical and electronics, and a, and a Bachelor of Laws degrees from the University of Western Australia in 2017. <laughs> but he also got his PhD degree in 2019. So from 2019 to 2022, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Michigan. So we came to, when I say we, really is CAS, came to know Professor Israel through Professor Steve Kang, a former UC chancellor, and now Professor Emeritus of UC. <clears throat> Professor Kang gave a CAS seminar last October, during which he spoke very highly of Jason. So we got to know uh, Jason way before today's event. So we're happy to have him here today with us. Both Professor uh, Ken and Professor Israel is actually uh, hosting, uh, chairing a technical session in the upcoming ISCAS. Uh, and the session is uh, neural systems based on emerging devices and circuit technologies. So now we come to Professor Israel's uh, research domain. So his research interests includes neuromorphic computing, spiking neural networks, and memory circuits. And he is the developer of SN, SNN Torch, a widely used Python network, a Python library used to train and model spiking neural networks. For his excellence in research and development, he was awarded the 2019 IEEE VLSI Systems Best Paper Award and the Best Paper Award at the 2019 IEEE AI CAS conference and the Best Live Demo Award at 2020 IEEE International Conference on Electronics, Circuits, and Systems and for his work in neuromorphic computing. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Israel. I feel like I should use ChatGPT to shorten my bio a little bit. Um, yeah, thanks for the intro. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I think you've got a pretty good feel for what I do, um, which is whatever I find interesting at the time. Give me a yell if you need me to stay in frame, because I'm gonna I'm gonna hop around. I'm gonna be everywhere, all over the place. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm basically just gonna talk about uh, my journey with research, where I started, the pain points that I found. There were a lot of pain points. Uh, at what point I hopped over to from hardware to software, and then back to hardware, and a bit of everything. <laughs> Uh, again, um, but trust me, it'll it'll hopefully make sense by the end. You'll you'll get a good feel as to why. Um, 
but other than that, let's let's keep things interactive. Uh, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions, comments, uh, anything that needs clarification or any ideas. Don't hesitate to um, interrupt. So with that being said, any questions? No, we're good. Okay, so at the moment, yeah, I, I moved to California just in September, I think. Uh, so I'm quite fresh here. Uh, started working at UC, at UC Santa Cruz, uh, setting up the Neuromorphic Computing Group, where the overarching goal is to apply principles of natural intelligence with the hopes of making artificial intelligence maybe a little bit better. Um, so I, I feel like I'm probably preaching of the choir a little bit here. Uh, but we're all pretty familiar with how in the domain of large language models and just all the recommender systems that are out there, all the really chunky and huge models, the power bill of AI training uh, of data centers just to run backprop for all of these uh, through ridiculously large data sets can very easily exceed the order of $1 million. Um, the backbone of ch uh, chat GPT, so GPT-3, for example, I think the projection is something like it, it took one nuclear reactor or the equivalent of a mid-sized nuclear reactor running for a month uh, just to, I guess, scrape the web and churn through uh, gradient descent and backprop, just, just to train that guy and with GPT-4. Of course, that's scaled. Unfortunately, we don't really know any details because the uh, paper that they published was more like a technical report without any interesting details. But such is life, such is open AI. Um, on the other hand, my brain can say these words powered off a sandwich, I guess. Uh, so 12 watts. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy. And the idea is to try and bridge this gap a little bit, try and figure out what makes the brain tick. How can we use those principles to make AI a little bit more effective? So I want to clarify, it's not really about um, emulating the brain for the sake of it, right? You mentioned calcium channels and whatnot. I, I, I have no idea why they could be made computationally useful. I know that they're great for generating action potentials, but if I don't understand why it could be adopted and made useful in an engineering context, I probably won't touch it. I'm sure that there are very uh, a slew of important features about the, the more low-level details of the brain, but if I don't understand it, I'm probably not going to touch it, um, Not un, at least not until I have a better feel for uh, um what's going on. So what makes the what, what is it that makes the brain so efficient? Or at least what do we know about the brain that can be made useful? So one of them is, I think, relatively well accepted amongst the community, right? We've got neurons and co-located with neurons, we have synapses, which is in stark contrast to your von Neumann architecture where RAM is over here, uh, processor is over here, and you're subject to bus band with limitations of shuttling data back and forth, right? Other ideas, you know, we've got this semblance of memory triggered computing, which kind of echoes in memory computing, but the idea is that uh, perhaps the brain's memories, in a sense, are going to be the uh, feature that triggers computation, right? So rather than accessing memory and then operating on it, it's kind of the memory that triggers itself. It's, it's the memory that triggers something to be, uh, to be processed. A uh, kind of neat analogy here is, say, DRAM, capacitive cells that store charge on them. Uh, you know, when when leaky integrate and fire neurons, which I'll go through in a little bit, are kind of like capacitors themselves. They're, they're leaky capacitors, so you know, an RC circuit. Um, so we can take a few parallels there in order to make computation a little bit more efficient. And then on the other hand, if you look at transformers, which take a huge sequence of data and uh, pass all of these tokens or words or syllabus, uh, syllables into, you can tell I've been focusing too much on teaching. I just said syllabus. Um, the uh, transformer architecture takes an entire sequence of tokens and feeds it into your model all at once, right? But the brain is a little bit more recurrent, right? It's a bit state-based. You're processing the words I'm saying kind of one at a time. Sure, you might be storing them and then making meaning at the end of a sentence, but ultimately life continues, right? Where we, in a way, process data in a batch size of one. Um, so there is a huge deal of recurrence in uh, in the brain and so a lot of feedback mechanisms that enable us to compute efficiently and i guess also to think about things there's also the idea of temporal encoding um, so rather than uh, storing values or storing concepts and ideas in full precision 32-bit floating point 
values, we've got action potentials, we've got spikes. And the working theory is that what we really care about is when these spikes occurred in time. Right? It's not about uh, the amplitude of the spike. It's not about the pulse width of the spike. I mean, hey, maybe those things are important. If they are, I'm not too sure about what makes them important, but we do know that timing of spikes matters a lot here. So a big theme to this neuromorphic computing group, and sure, neuromorphic is a made up word, but technically every word is made up, uh, where we're just trying to take ideas from the brain that make sense to making engineering a little bit better. And to just further motivate this, we've seen circuits go from across every abstraction, go from 1D up to 3D, right? This goes from process technologies where you apply a voltage to uh, build up a channel of electrons, of a, con of a conductive pathway, where in your planar FETs, you apply your voltage and you control one dimension of your transistor up to gate all around FETs, where you get a little bit more control and more dimensions um, when you apply voltage. And then with memory circuits, you see, I guess, uh, the 3D cross point, rest in peace, and uh, 3D NAND flash and all of that. Everything's kind of taking advantage of vertical real estate at the moment. Uh, so AMD's Vcache, even image sensors like to plonk a processor on top of your image sensing uh, device. And then uh, the, the thing that I'm kind of looking at is how do we keep moving past that? Like once you've taken advantage of all of your physical dimensions, what's next? What's left? How do you keep going? So trying to think of how can we exploit things in time in the fourth dimension and that's kind of what the brain does right i want to take and then we want to take those computational principles that underpin the brain and integrate them with silicon and i guess with software as well because ultimately it's the the the, the neural hardware is just a physical manifestation of the neural software they're kind of one and the same thing so what have people done in the past to accelerate ai workloads uh You've got the bottom-up approach in memory computing, you process, uh, you, you set your, you could either go in the direction of processing in your memory substrate or throw memory all around your processor and this kind of L2 cache approach, which a lot of uh, startups are doing with AI accelerators. Um, Dataflow is an example of uh, having deterministic pathways in which data must traverse uh, and we can exploit that. On the other end of the spectrum where you go top down, people are tackling this problem from the software abstraction where you train, say, quantized neural nets because maybe full precision is overkill. Maybe we can crank that down to eight bits or four bits or so something a little bit, uh, we, we can, you know, real, the real world is very noisy, right? You know, we, can, we can exploit that in neural nets. We can approximate things. Um, we've also seen compressed models and, and whatnot. But then in, in my view, somewhere in between there is spike-based processing and encoding things over time. I mean, the longer you have to process things, you have this kind of way to adapt precision, right? It, it echoes this sentiment of delta sigma modulators if, to all my ADC people in there. Uh, you know, you spend more time reading something out, you can get a more precise value. Um, you know, maybe the brain has some, some mechanism in order to adapt to uh, varying precision. So just to start my journey in, this was, this kind of started out in the PhD days and I've, um, adopted a few uh, graphics from my postdoc advisors um, in my time in my postdoc advisors group at the University of Michigan. But we were looking at, is the video playing now? We don't want to, seems like a bit of, yeah, hit me. So you said you worked on Relay for your PhD? Yeah. Uh, is that really even to the price model, a startup in Canada? Yeah. Justin, do you want to take that one? <laughs> I know, but I don't actually know where losing. So, but yeah, my, my postdoc advisor was, uh, I want to say he was co-founder before I joined his group. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if their status at the moment, but yeah, I think to start with, they were pursuing that. I'm not sure where they're at right now with it though. Um, but yeah, so yeah, the, the, during the PhD and a little bit into the postdoc, I was largely working with these emerging memory devices, RERAM, Memristas, what have you. Um, the video doesn't seem to want to play, but the general high level idea is you apply a voltage to some device to perhaps a metal suboxide and you're modulating the conductive pathway of, of that device. You know, you're, you're physically moving ions around. And because these devices can be, you know, on the, on the nanoscale uh, order, 
a rather small voltage is enough to build up a massive electric field to actually move these bulky ions about. You apply a voltage, you form a conductive pathway. That's a low resistance. And then you remove that voltage and that pathway stays where it is. So that's a form of non-volatile memory, right? Uh, just stored in the form of a resistance. And it's quite easy to fabricate in the back end of the line um, on top of your uh, transistor. And then where you take that, where a lot of research groups took that and really battled with getting functional things out of it was in crossbar arrays. Uh, and so this is one very rudimentary example just to highlight what people do with it in this three by three structure. Let's say you have a bunch of uh, resistors here, which are you know, pre-programmed memristors using offline trained neural nets. You apply a voltage at your inputs. And because of Kirchhoff's current law, hopefully we remember ECE 101, uh, you generate a current. And then because these are all uh, acc accumulating on the same bit line, you've got this uh, sum of products operation happening. We parallelize that across columns, across bit lines, and we get to do a whole heap more of them in one hit. Um, so at some point in my life, we taped out a rather crappy 65 nanometer mixed signal array that just kind of did a proof of concept on this thing. Um, and But yeah, the, the, the idea is that you can program the RAM conductances to correspond to some neuron weights in your artificial neural network. You apply your input data and you have a really nice way of doing matrix vector multiplications uh, without increasing time complexity uh, under certain constraints. So that was that. That was all well and good. I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, but that was just a Delta Sigma ADC that we designed using a couple of little tricks where the uh, duty cycle of the output was proportionate to your analog current readout. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the more time you spent reading things out, the more precise you could get. And we kind of explored the distribution of the currents and the activations from your neural network. So if you had something that was, if you had a, like an out of distribution or a very large activation, we didn't spend too long reading it, uh, spend too long getting precise readout values because large is large. And we just were happy with that. Um, if something was negative, more often than not, you use a rectification activation function. So we didn't waste too much time reading that out. We just killed it. So that, that, those were some nice little tricks that we used to accelerate those types of workloads. Um, also characterized various quantization regimes and, uh, and whatnot, but let's not get too bogged down by the numbers. I'm not too interested in that, to be honest. Uh, the challenges that we faced here. So in this particular instance, uh, we found that you know, your improvement from using RAM in the back end of the line to non-RAM based circuits was not huge, not in this case at least. Uh, 1.5 to 3x improvements that we found were kind of insufficient to justify the cost of you know, throwing money at some slightly exotic process. Scaling challenges as well. You know, a lot of your fancy bleeding edge nodes aren't really tailored to ADCs. I mean, we can argue about that later. <laughs> you know, scaling was a bit of a pain. Um, and then the ADCs also tended to dominate the latency and the energy consumption in these particular chips. So yeah, scaling was a huge pain point here. Um, so the focus kind of switched to removing ADCs. And how could we do that? Well, I think we've, I've alluded to this a little bit maybe we could change the algorithms that we're accelerating, right? Is there some way that we could discretize into single bit activations, uh, our, our artificial neural nets? So spiking neural nets could be the way to go here. So I wanna give a high level intuitive description of what a, what kind of makes the brain tick with, with, with respect to spikes? Um, I don't, I, yeah. Sorry, sorry to so, no, good. Just like, like you mentioned what fast, but it's just really, Yep. Yeah, because at the time we didn't realize that there was so many, or that, that it could be so cheap. <laughs> right. At the time it was a it was far less back end of the line process. And so we thought, oh, okay, well, depending on what oxides you're using, it might be a new new technique that you need to deposit or a new chemical that you need to deposit sorry but yeah it's people are finding that you know people uh, that there are a lot of guess, materials that are already in your cmos processes so that is a little bit outdated a sentence i can't back that up yeah yeah sorry could you repeat that could you just do like a pre packaging in the process rather than like uh, 
or just have like memory selection or then just package them in a in a three platform. Okay, can that can that work? Can yeah. I mean, I, I don't see why not. Um, that would still be a, what would that add? That'd add a little bit extra latency. Um, would you have synchronize? I mean, yeah, then you'd have to synchronize a clock to another package. Um, I, mean, it's, I don't see why not. It would, it would add, that'd add a few more costs than this. Yeah. And, and the last thing, so yeah, the chip that you showed on the previous slide, uh, how, how did you how did you build that? What process was that? What what founder is that? Uh, that was it's TPS code, I think. Was that a Panasonic? Was a Panasonic process, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was very very niche at the time. I, I, what was it? I think it was a. It was actually tailored for image sensing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You said Panasonic, right? I want to say Panasonic. Yeah. What was it? Sixty five nanometer process. Yeah. Okay, because I know Panasonic has pretty extensive research into the UVAN. Yeah. Right? They actually commercialize the microcontrollers and how they even run the process for Panasonic. Using reram. I, I didn't even know that. What? I didn't even know that. <laughs> it's a pretty minor product. So right. It's just Quite niche, control. yeah. Just something that needs to be programmed once, ideally, and then you just flash it and, well, within reram's constraints, and then let it run, right? Like, right. Have a yeah, yeah, yeah. At least they don't have the fast power. Only for the gotcha. I'm sort of kind of unsurprising. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, I have a question. We said the ADC that is like maybe 50% of the energy is functioning. What about the, the dot? Is it useful in any uh, iron uh, way or it's just if we use the uh, same process? Yeah, the dots are significantly cheaper than the ADC. I want to say it's um, close to th th This is characterized in reading. When you program, then you program every cell one at a time using a charge pump with a higher voltage. Um, so when we're reading out or actually running the network, that's the way when you just characterize the energy. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the solution, what's the solution for that? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, so the, 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 uh, for the DAC, that would have been, uh, I want to say eight bits. This was, this was a very long time ago now. But yeah, eight bits of the output and then reading out. I mean, we're hoping that, yeah, well, the readout was adaptive, adaptable the longer you spend, the more accurate you would get a readout. So you have eight bits on the dots and eight bits on the ADC. I don't want to say eight bit on the ADC, um, but if you spent enough time, then yeah, you get eight bits. But of course, the RAM themselves are going to introduce some percentage variation in there as well, which is another reason to throw that 8 bit figure out of kind of whack, right? I mean, it's 8 bit, but then everything that's kind of contributing to that 8 bits is a little bit rather error prone, right? It's quite challenging to make some, uh, cement claims about it. Yeah. Uh, quick, short question. Um, was this done like in the late 2000s? Yeah, I think it started in 2018. 2018? Yeah. 2006. No, no, no. 2008. How old was I? I think I was still in high school. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the oh, right, right, right. Gotcha. Yeah, a bit of historical context. Uh, look, HP published their fancy nature paper that made a link between the 1971 post theoretical postulation of the memory star uh, to titanium oxides um, in 2008. And then everyone started to pump resources into trying to scale that up for the ever since. <laughs> yeah, I I don't think it was until it, it was Wei Lu that did the first CMOS RM integration in, or in academia at least. In that was published in 2019, right? Justin was on that paper, <laughs> um, throwing you under the bus. Yeah, it was 2019, right? Yeah, I, I want to say that that was probably the biggest milestone in, insofar as making these things useful went yeah how are we doing any other questions on that cool all right so in essence did it work well Eh, could have been better so that's what motivated us to look at different algorithms to accelerate to hopefully address some of the um analog accumulation pain points that we were facing so yeah towards more biological neural networks 
the three S, I, I like to distill this down into the three S's, right? So the first S is spikes, all right? So your biological neurons in your brain, they're interacting by a single bit spikes instead of you know, floating point activations, right? So if, if you actually think about a biological, uh, physical neuron, then you know, if, if you sufficiently excite it, then it's going to trigger an action potential. And at the neuron body, this what I've labeled the soma, you can excite that a little bit and you'll get some fluctuations uh, and whatnot. But my electrode, if I, if I take that one millimeter away from that soma, all of, that, all of those perturbations are going to be attenuated. It's not until the action potential kicks in, until you get these higher order dynamics where a spike is actually triggered and propagated to downstream neurons. Um, so that leads us to this idea that neurons communicate via action potentials. And like I said before, we're not so sure how the width of the action potential matters or the amplitude of the action potential matters. In, in most cases, they're very stereotypically the same thing, about 70 millivolts or 100 millivolts of perturbation. So that leads us to think that it's the timing of the, act, of the spike that matters rather than the precise voltage characteristics and the shape. Now, in a lot of neural coding studies, we just abstract that, right, to the existence of a spike. If there's a spike, we treat that as a one. In the absence of a spike, we treat that as a zero. And you can kind of see that this is, this could be very nice in the context of a neural network, right? If you pump a, if you do a, vector, a, a vector matrix multiplication using something that's just you know, filled with zeros and ones, every time you have a zero, you scale that by some a very large number of parameters, it's just going to be zero. Zero times a weight is just zero. So don't do that step. If you have a one, one times your weight is just the weight. So yeah, you have to read from memory. You have to uh, go ahead and do that, but you manage to at least you know, amortize some of that multiplication over time instead. The second S, any questions? <laughs> right. The second S, sparsity, which I, okay, we've done a bit of a spoiler reveal. Sparsity, right? In addition to uh, sparsely having to, hopefully having to, only very infrequently act, uh, access, do, do memory accesses, you've also got a memory advantage in this as well, right? If you have a vector, if, you know, uh, I, I could read this and say zero, 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 blah, 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 seven, zero, zero, blah, 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 five, but a far more efficient representation is to say seven at position 10, five at position 20. So, you know, you only increase memory capacity every time you have a non-zero element. So there are some memory uh, benefits here to using sparse activations as well. Um, and you, know, you can train your neural networks such that they are more sparse. So th th this echoes a bit of a run length encoding kind of sentiment. And then the next advantage, there we go, is static suppression, also known as event-driven processing, uh, which goes more off to the sensory periphery side of things rather than actual processing. But you know, th there's a lot of interesting sensors out there that are uh, taking this neuromorphic approach of suppressing static information, right? So, I mean, you might be looking at me. This whole background is in your sensory view as well, but you're not processing it because it's static, it's uninteresting, you're not really paying attention to it. And so, you know, your brain knows not to process that. And it turns out that there are cameras that are being produced by you know, Prophecy and Sony and Innie in Switzerland, and they literally process motion and nothing else, right? So you know, potentially effective for security camera activation uh, uh, applications and that. Um, just as a bit of a um, showcase of a few bits of footage that have been captured. So, I mean, I think Zoom is adding a heap of latency to um, what I can show you here, but you can record T cells, for example, and try to predict whether well, what cells are, uh, what ramifications different cells have through a fluidic setup at a very high frame rate because and the reason you can get such high frame rates out of these cameras is because all of your pixels are asynchronous with respect to one another. So you don't need to do any sort of frame integration. Um, so if you're suppressing everything that's unchanging, then you just clock your pixels as they change themselves. I mean, there is a limit on how frequently they can fire, but that's the spirit of it. I don't know if I can show you how cool this video looks, but you know, you've got, no, it's going to freeze up, but the folk at Prophecy filmed a laser pointer um, and they can actually extract that uh, the end of the laser pointer moving, which, which I thought was very cool. Um, unfortunately, we don't get to see that in full resolution, full temporal resolution here, but that's okay. So that, that's on this. Uh, any questions there? So, 
uh, was not a single spike. It's usually a, a series of spikes before those set of events in some way. <clears throat> so I don't know how that signifies the speed of the understanding or whatever the thing is. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So in, I want to say in the 50s with the Hodgkin Huxley squid axon, yeah, they showed that. Um, Information is, and there were some other studies where they looked at particular receptive fields to see what, uh, which part of your V1 cortex, uh, sorry, the, your early vision re, uh, processing regions that are very receptive to particular angles of light. You know, if you, if you have like a 45 degree bar of light and you move it across a screen, will particular regions of your brain fire? Or particular neurons fire, and they found that you know individual neurons that are very susceptible to particular features, particular angles, and particular bars of light are going to fire a train of spikes. Right. One thing that's lesser appreciated is if you actually look at that data, there's also a timing component in there as well. So the first spike fires before all the other ones. So there is a rate involved in there. There's also a temporal component, and as far as I kind of understand. Your retinal ganglion cells that trigger a spike train to your visual cortex, they're firing in a spike train. Once you get to the visual cortex and as you go into higher, uh, I guess, regions of vision processing, you get far sparser firing. You kind of go into conceptual regions like the neuroscience analog is the Jennifer Aniston neuron. You see a picture of Jennifer Aniston. I saw a bunch of eyes flick up. Then, then you get a spike there, but it's otherwise... How often are we thinking about Jennifer Aniston? Probably not so much now that Friends isn't on TV. So that's that's the kind of spirit of things. Rates are definitely important, but also there's a theory, there's another paper from, I want to say 2001 by Bruno Olshausen, who says uh, the paper title was awesome. It's what is the other 85% of V1 doing, right? What he means by that is if we accept the premise that rate codes are what matter, as in spike trains are what matter, and if neurons encode data in multiple spikes, then based on energy arguments and metabolism approximations, then there is no chance in hell that the brain wouldn't overheat, right? So if every neuron was firing a rate on the order of what the Hodgkin-Huxley folk uh, discovered, then yeah, the brain would cook up and turn into an oven. You probably wouldn't be able to do too much useful once your skull's melted there. So yeah, he, he makes the argument that um, temp, there's got to be a temporal code for 85% of your neurons. I'm not sure where we're at on the status of that. Yeah. Um, no, I was just going to say that there's actually a lot of misunderstanding of what you know the data is supposed to like. For example, people often make a statement, oh, you only lose 1% of your brain at any given time. That's completely false. Yeah. You're probably using 80, 90%. But it's doing something, yeah. not what you're doing. So, so I think a lot of times when you come from a computer world, you think everything's linear. You have to queue things. You have to make decisions. It's hierarchical. Mm. Whereas in the biology world, it's not like that. It's like multiple things are happening, and then it's trying to see the best fit for what it, whatever it can do. Yeah. So in other words, um, you know, I probably I don't know how many do I envision, but for example, they, they found interesting things like the way. Human cameras process things is always limited by your resolution, how many pixels, what order you do it, you scan, is it back in order? But that's not how your brain works. So the brain does multiple things. It's on the one hand, it's doing an absolute kind of computation, it's also doing kind of a relative computation. It's also comparing today with five minutes ago, it's also comparing today with 10 years ago. And all these things are floating out there. And one place stores certain things, another place stores a directory to go to those things. And so a lot of the, the reason why we have a problem is because computer, as humans imagine, we try to be very efficient and try to always have a fork and go left or right. But the brain doesn't do that. It goes wandering down 20 different forks, comes back as you need it, you know, in a simplistic way. Yeah. So if you insist on superimposing the algorithm the way, you know, more than whatever this algorithm is, it's never going to work. And you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyone want to dispute that? I don't want to dispute that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I completely agree. Um, based on how we're going, I'm not sure if we'll get to my final slides, but yeah, it very much addresses this idea of controlling difference learning where brains are 
machines that, I mean, they do many things. One of the things that they do could very well be uh, trying to minimize the element of surprise, right? When you take the bus or drive to work, you do it the first time, you're taking in your surroundings, you're understanding the pathways that you'll be taking. You do that after a year, after five years, you stop processing things. It just kind of becomes mechanical and you just do it. Um, and then if, and in that way, maybe that's one reason as to why things get a little bit more efficient. But then if you're suddenly, you, I don't know, a pothole gets kicked into your daily morning routine, then your brain might be surprised by that. And then triggers a bit of extra power consumption, for example. But one of the things that we are trying to do is see how we can use the present in order to, I guess, suppress um, the amount of energy it takes to train things in the future. But hopefully I'll get to that because that's very, very relevant to what you're describing. Uh, so there was a raised hand there. Uh, yeah, uh, just to follow up on the, the questioner's question, um, I think that thing about people only use like one percent of their brain hypothesis or whatever mm -hmm. point, it seems kind of like in like let's say microprocessor design, mm -hmm. I think usually only about like a few percent of the circuits are actually really done any meaningful calculation. Mm -hmm. The rest of the structure is basically like to support, support. that that small amount of circuitry yeah. that actually does, does something actual useful. Computation. Yeah. You need, still need that all that cache memory and registers yep. and you know, yep. cycle buffers and all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, people don't typically associate vision processing with the cardiac cycle, right? But your brain is regulating that, isn't it? So, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm not really sure. I don't, I don't pay too much attention to those sensationalist brain only uses 1% of its computational resources at the time because I don't know what to make of it, yeah. right? So going on with that, one of the um, goals out, outside of the sensory side of things was to actually do computation with biological neuron models, right? One of the most uh, rudimentary, actually, I would say the most rudimentary biological neuron model, hopefully we get some visual action here, is, you know, you've got an element of temporal integration um, at the side of your neuron. So if I was to pump that neuron with a that pump that node that represents a neuron body with spikes over time, then eventually, if that neuron is sufficiently excited, then it's going to trigger its own spike to downstream neurons, right? And because these time the, these spikes are distributed across time, then that's got to suggest that there's some sort of temporal integration in there. Um, as it turns out, this temporal in integration is uh, for a leaky integrate and fine neuron is actually modeled by an RC circuit. Uh, so hopefully this looks a little familiar if it if it uh, displays. But you know you inject a current into your input neuron, and the membrane potential, which is the voltage difference between uh, it's the outside of your neuron membrane and the inside of your neuron membrane. Uh, that membrane potential is going to jump up. And then in absence of any input, it exponentially relaxes to some steady state value, uh, which is I think negative 70 millivolts uh, in, the, in, in your brain. And if you trigger a series of spikes, a lot of spike train, then you might be able to get something that uh, triggers some threshold. But this is a very, very coarse abstraction of biological neurons, which are far, far higher order than, uh, than what I'm showing you here. But this is computationally simple, and this allows for us to take advantage of, I guess, sparsity and uh, reduce memory accesses as a result. So every time you get a threshold, then you trigger a spike. So what's uh, what's the what's the deal with this, right? Um, the what you're able to do here, well, what the what one of the goals was was to make this compatible with deep learning based techniques, right? I mean. As far as we're concerned, we see backpropagation is one of the most, or it is the most popular training algorithm because it is functionally effective, right? I mean, it was derived based on functional optimization. So can we recast that RC circuit, that leaky integrated by a neuron into something that resembles a recurrent neuron, a uh, recurrent neuron in the sense of what we know in the deep learning landscape, and then be able to steal all of the training algorithms from deep learning in order to make these things hopefully perform as well as deep learning models with hopefully a little bit more efficiency. Um, of course, training is, training is expensive. The, the sole act of running back propagation on something like that is still expensive. So what I'm getting at is you train it using expensive GPUs or whatever, and then during the forward pass, hopefully then it's a little bit cheaper. So that only addresses one part of the problem, but then you know, addressing the training challenges comes later. Um, I'll hopefully get to that. So in this case, this se sequence of nodes and whatnot, you've got your forward pass. And if, if you were to ignore everything from T1 onwards, 
one of these pathways is just like a forward path for a single neuron, right? But then your membrane potential denoted by U here is the membrane is your membrane potential, right? And you scale that by some value beta, which corresponds to a decay rate, which is the decay that you see in this new membrane that's been plotted. So you keep multiplying, you keep scaling that membrane potential by some decay rate beta, and that will enable some exponential relaxation back to a steady state value. So as we move left to right, you're moving forward in time. And the idea is that we can hopefully use uh, techniques that are already out there um, in order to train spiking neuron models. Is that coarsely, does that coarsely make sense to people? Yeah. So then this membrane potential is then going to be thresholded, right? Any trigger is spike. But can anyone identify why this might be a problem when we apply gradient descent? Is that threshold function differentiable? No. I mean, you can, but you're just going to get a heap of zeros and some some Dirac delta in there, right? So that in in black is the operator that you're applying, right? So the membrane potential, uh, if it's sub threshold, it's going to be a zero. You're not going to trigger a spike. If it's greater than the threshold, uh, then you trigger a spike. That's represented by a heavy side step. Um, and if I was to take the derivative of that, uh, then I just get a threshold shifted uh, Dirac delta function. So. The way that the community has kind of congregated and addressed this is using what's called surrogate gradient descent, which is just a gradient approximation. Works beautifully. Uh, we do this with quantization aware training as well. So honestly, there's nothing really that fancy to this, but it works incredibly well. Um, so we know that neural nets are very tolerant to approximations in the gradient um, during training. Uh, there are limitations to that uh, that I will get to, but uh, insofar as spiking neural nets are concerned, it does a pretty good job. So that's as far as one single neuron is concerned. So we scale this up. We then apply back propagation through time. So can't really see the animation, but you get an error signal at the very end of your pathway across multiple layers of these neurons, across many neurons. Keep in mind, this is just one single neuron shown across four different time sets, and you propagate errors back to your weight. So you need a learnable parameter when you're training neural networks, and that comes from your scaled current value denoted by x times w. Um, Go into more detail if you're interested in that. Um, Going to fly over this, but this is the just, just a, an example of the equation that uh, is used for leaky integrate and fine neurons, right? Um, and so as you move forward in time, your membrane potential exponentially decays, right? As you move back in time, if I was to take the derivative of this function with respect to uh, the voltage between two different time steps, then all we have is beta, your decay rate, which is some value between zero and one. So as you move back in time, your gradient is going to scale as well. Um, so all of this is what, once you apply surrogate gradient descent, we can take all the principles from deep learning, backprop through time, which are very commonly used in your recurrent architectures, LSTMs, et cetera, and port them over to spiking neural networks such that we can now apply this to something with sparsely activated uh, neural networks. So that's all well and good. Um, then we also kind of took it a step further and uh, adopted techniques in the spirit of real-time recurrent learning, because if you, if you think about backprop through time, you do your entire forward pass to the very end of your simulation, so it's a predefined number of steps, you're keeping track of the gradients at every single node, and then you propagate those errors back through your pathway. Clearly, the, the brain probably doesn't do that very confident the brain doesn't do that, right? We don't store the state of every single thing that's ever happened to us and then do an update at the end of our lives. Just doesn't make sense. We're continuously learning, continuously adapting. And so created this little tricksy a, a technique to um, uh, train networks where using some, some arguments of symmetry, we were able to push gradients forward in time. So when I present it like this, it's kind of trivial how you would do that, but uh, for whatever reason, it just didn't seem to be an idea that took off or kind of presented itself in the literature. The backprop through memory, uh, backprop through time, the memory complexity is uh, scales linearly with the number of neurons scaled by the number of time steps. But then backprop to the future, memory complexity is only dependent on the number of neurons. And I want to say this with the caveat that big O notation is a very academic thing that often doesn't translate too realistically to a uh, to practice. But for what it's worth, it, it was a cool approach to do continuous learning um, over time. And we kind of uh, observed something interesting, right? So as I said, as we move backwards in time, the gradients of each of your weights are going to scale exponentially, right? Um, so as, as, a, as an example here, let's say that I have a, a later layer in my network. 
and I back propagate to an earlier layer, uh, say at t equals minus one, so one step previous prior to this spiking. Uh, and, and what we see is we get maybe one term of beta decaying our gradient. If we go further back, then the gradient scales further. And if we keep going further back, then our gradient just keeps, it, it vanishes, right? It, it, it eventually, well, never hits zero, but for all intents and purposes, it, it gets infinitely close to zero. So what I'm getting at here is that this whole curve looks very similar to, if you're familiar with spike time dependent plasticity, that's a learning rule that was derived. No, sorry, it wasn't derived. It was experimentally measured. So we took the pair of neurons, BM2 took two neurons back in 1998. It took the, they measured the synaptic conductance, the strength of that conductance between these two neurons and measured this firing time of neuron A, the firing time of neuron B, and found a relationship between the difference in firing time and how much the conductance was updated. And they found that it was exp the, the, the synaptic conductance would uh, update exponentially uh, as you brought the two spikes together. And depending on the order of those spikes, it would either be a positive conductance change or a negative conductance change. So that left half plane is pretty similar to backprop through time, right? Why is that important? Backprop through time was derived. It was based on function optimization. Spike timing dependent plasticity, on the other hand, was measured, right? Came from completely different avenues. And we, in a way, we like STDP because it's a local learning rule. It only depends on uh, nodes that are immediately adjacent to the synaptic weight that you're updating. So that should kind of echo, echo some uh, idea of efficiency, right? If you don't have to route a gradient, a signal to every single node that you've calculated, such as in backprop through time, and maybe there's something cheap. So, so the idea here is that you can actually take a huge chunk out of backprop through time, replace it with something cheaper like SCDP and kind of get a mix of, uh, of both worlds. So we've actually taken all these ideas, smushed them together into this Python library called SNN Torch, which lets you do gradient-based learning with spike neural networks and mesh things around and you know, do a bit of local learning combined with gradient-based learning as well. Um, it's open sourced on GitHub. Uh, it's just a Python package for gradient-based optimization. It enables real-time online learning, um, seamless integration with PyTorch. So if you're familiar with PyTorch, so Meta's and Facebook's um, I guess primary deep learning software, then you basically can port over to SNN Torch very, very easily. Um, CUDA accelerated because we're piggybacking off a lot of PyTorch features, but we also linked up with GraphCore and uh, added some microcode to make it compatible with their IPUs, which is kind of cool. Um, but it's also lightweight enough for CPUs. So there are a few tricks that we played in order to enable that. And a few places have actually used it and showcased it, which is pretty cool. Um, so that was all well and good. Um, what I'm actually more, I guess, proud of is the fact that this tutorial series for SNN Torch kind of became a de facto entry point for a lot of students and academics and even industry folk that were interested in getting into uh, neuromorphic algorithms um, and basically a starting point to get learning about all this stuff. So there's a lot of interactive code snippets that you know, take you from zero to neuromorphic software expert. Um, so it shows you how to code these things from scratch and then make it a lot easier syntactically uh, with an SNN tour. So I, th I think that's all pretty cool. If you're interested in getting a little bit deeper with this, then I'd recommend checking these tutorials out. Um, I think we're closing in pretty close to seven o'clock. Um, so I'll fly through the rest of it, but did a bunch of uh, multimodal data set evaluations using a variety of different uh, hardware in order to benchmark how these things perform. So multimodal in the sense that, you know, we, we trained a network to identify hand gestures, something pretty vanilla. Um, on the one hand, we had conventional cameras that, uh, that were fed into a non-spiking network. And on the other hand, we had event-based cameras that suppressed your background. Simultaneously, we had electromyography signals that were reading out muscle uh, electrical signals from muscle variation at the same time. Um, you know, we trained it on Intel's Loihi. Uh, sorry, we, we trained these things offline and then run forward, uh, forward pass solely on these hard, on these different, uh, I guess, hardware setups. So Loihi, NVIDIA's Jetson Nano, and then an academic chip from Charlotte Frankel, Morph IC. Um, of course, Loihi was constrained to eight bits and I think 96 to 95.4% isn't too meaningful, but the point is there that they were pretty competitive with one another, which is 
a, a, a good case for spiking neural networks being trained to the same or similar efficacy as uh, non-spiking networks. But I guess what's uh, a little bit more important was, I guess, the energy delay product, because uh, I mean, you have far fewer computations because there are far fewer spikes or far fewer activations in your non-spiking uh, setup. And so, you know, you're moving towards potentially 100x-ish, um, a couple of orders of magnitude of better performance there. Now, there are a lot of caveats to to that that I'm kind of going to fly through. I'm going to going to skip over this, but then what we ended up doing was got the algorithm stuff out of the way, found a way to train spiking neural nets pretty effectively. So we're all happy and whatnot. But then there were a lot of uh, quirky ideas that we wanted to experiment with, right? So one example was, I mean, spike-based processing lends itself to asynchronous circuits. If you can do things that are data triggered rather than clock triggered, then that kind of makes sense. Imagine your sensor has nothing new to process and there's no data being pumped into your accelerator, right? Wouldn't it be nicer to just let your chip go quiet, right? So we've been experimenting with uh, Rajit Manohar's uh, ACT tools, uh, his asynchronous circuit toolkit, um, but because it's such a high risk kind of area and we're not sure if what we're doing is actually going to work, um, we're using the Google sponsored shuttles. Um, so if you're not familiar, Google throw, throw a heap of money at Skywater in order to underwrite a bunch of tape outs, which are pretty cool. Um, and the idea is that, you know, deep learning, the success in deep learning was in part due to the open source movement. So porting this hype train over to uh, hardware isn't a bad idea, making things a little bit more accessible. Yep. Uh, there's a lot of people at Santa Cruz whose focus are on open source hardware, me included. Um, I think the person you might be thinking about is Matthew Goodhouse, the developer of OpenRAM. So every single, MP yeah, but, but a lot of them are doing open source hardware at various abstractions. Some are creating their own HLSs and yeah, all, all over the spectrum. <laughs> Are you like Hell yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, Matt and I, are, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll get there. I mean, will I get there? We're at seven o'clock. We want to go eat some food. Yeah. Oh, can I back out a little bit? I think a lot of this is from the viewpoint of electrical engineering. Sure. So we always think of electrons, and that's all we care about, right? But I think a very big flaw, maybe I'm mistaken, is that in reality you're missing the chemistry piece. Sure. Right, a lot of times, like the whole body has to do, like, why in this case, why do you use sodium? In other case, why do you use some potassium? The spikes are exactly the same, look exactly the same. Yeah, but why do you do it? Because of the cascading thing within another cascading sure. thing, which is an anti cascading. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And Absolutely, so yeah. You look at everything as strictly voltages. Yep. You're missing like 90% of it. So oh, 90%. Like, I'd argue that we're missing 99.9% .9 of it. Right. Yeah. It. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yep. No, I get that. But then how do I make that useful if I don't understand what they're good for? Yeah, but the people said it needs no no chemistry. Yeah, but I don't know how to make that fact useful, right? When we're constrained to, I mean, a silicon market, what 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 dictates success in hardware? Money, right? So if I want to make something that works, that makes something that's efficient, then do I spend my time playing with chemistry? I mean, maybe there are people that are doing that. But I think it would be a terrible idea to focus solely on that, right? Don't we want to take a look at what are the principles that actually could be ported from the brain into hardware that makes sense? I think, no? You don't agree? Well, back it up then, <laughs> right? I, that, that's all well and good to not agree, but I mean, yeah. The medicine is so empirical though. Right, but the reason why drugs work is because of empirical. Because they're interrupting all these uh cycles sure. that occur in nature where things are diffusing and yep. moving and combining and reacting. I, I'm I'm not disagreeing with any of that, right? But my point is how do I make that useful? But when you look at all these spikes and temporal stuff, mm -hmm. it's like looking at one dimension of an n dimension. And when you look at non-spiking neural networks, it's like looking at what? 0 0.5 dimensions? Yeah. It's it's incremental, right? I, mean, I would love to be able to take if, if I could understand everything to it, I'd love to, but Hey, I'm just one dimensional, right? <laughs> yep. Okay. Agree to disagree. So yeah, I mean, I'm going to just wrap up <laughs> and go for dinner. Um, a couple of cool things that we did was, yeah, we, before I subjected my grad students to um, the all-nighters that were associated with tape outs, I wanted to make sure that these open source EDAs 
uh, tool flows actually worked. Um, and I put myself through a week of horror before subjecting the grad students to the week of horror. But yeah, we ended up doing a couple of neat little tape house. These are pretty small things. I'm going to fly over the numbers, not to don't care too much about them, to be honest. Uh, th this isn't a highly performant chip by any means. This was just a something to make sure that we could get things to work. Um, I'll fly through. We also tested out the tolerance of spiking neural networks to extreme binarization. So, I mean, the activations are already constrained to being between zero and one. What if the weights were constrained to being binarized as well? In this case, positive one and minus one. Um, and by applying quantization aware to uh, training to binarize spiking neural networks, then it turns out that they are extremely robust uh, to that degree of extreme quantization, something that artificial neural nets can't stack up to when it comes to binarized uh, spiking neural nets. So this is going from the blue to orange. I mean, MNIST, we can ignore that. It's a benchmark. It's very solved. But then DVS gesture is a type of neuromorphic benchmark that uses event cameras and actually has time varying features in there. And the accuracy degradation is very minuscule there. So, so that has, has a fair bit of promise in terms of using um, extreme quantization techniques. Uh, jumping a little bit more forward. So we have been, when I say we, I'm going to bring this up. So Google kept throwing more money at Skywater because uh, I guess they were kind of a research foundry and spun out of the Department of Defense. And they actually were playing a lot with RAM. And so with enough money, that they convinced them to open source their uh, Sky 130B PDK. And they're actually spinning up uh, RAM in the back end of the line. So hafnium oxides, um, which is great. It gives us a battleground for testing out more exotic chips. So that's, that's one thing that we've been working on. Um, but then we're left with a bunch of pain points. So RM is a pain for a variety of reasons. I mean, if you want to form your devices to actually make them programmable, you have to apply extremely or well, relatively high voltages, which means that with the 1T1R array, your transistors need to be pretty damn big to be able to sustain that current density that it actually forms a conductive pathway in the first instance. Yeah. What is the voltage that you program the that you're yep, down here. So a read voltage is for this particular device is between 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 volts. Your set voltage, which is a positive conductance change, is 1.7 volts. Your reset voltage and negative conductance change is 2.5 volts. Uh, your forming voltage, which actually ruptures a filament between your metal electrodes, is 2.2 to 3.1 volts, which calls for a bunch of charge pumps. So basically, in today's process technology, that's kind of high frequency. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so a bunch of pain points. So, is this the state of the art that you know about the RM? No, definitely not. This is open source, and there's a lot of problems with open source. Um, how old did you? How, how, how old did you? Oh, I'm not sure. I know that the um, system was one characterized it and actually made it publicly available in a research paper, but I'm not sure what the yield is. Did you guys put the chips in the on your? We're in the process of making it. Yeah, yeah. So, this is current work. At the moment, we're building, I'm working with Matt Glithouse, who's uh, the, the developer of OpenRAM, which takes in open source PDKs. It's a memory compiler for building, uh, um, I guess, memory macros, soft memory macros. And uh, we're trying to do the same thing with RAM. It's a substantially more nuanced and taking us a lot longer than we thought it would because of these charge pumps, because of these various voltage domains that we have to operate in, because we don't even know what the optimal sense at current do we want to charge mode or current mode sense have to fire a lot of open questions and we're just kind of tackling it one by one and seeing what works um another issue here that is a pain point and why we haven't gotten test chips back is because there was a bunch of timing errors in the uh caravel harness the the pad frame that we're stuck with um which means that skywater or e fabulous have taken a lot longer with these chips than we would have liked so this was all designed a year and a half ago. <laughs> Still haven't gotten them back. So but, but yeah, so pros and cons, right? I mean, I'm a huge proponent for open source, but expectation management is also very important with these things, right? I mean, people aren't given these constraints. I don't think you're going to be making money off it. <laughs> not yet. Another question? So what kind of tool did you use for the... Uh, I'm not an expert in, in the physical... Yeah, it was, oh, it was purely... Oh, yeah, so it's, it's like... There's a lot of them out there. A lot of open source EDA tool flows that are out there. So Silicon Compiler, Open Lane, all the, their target market is a push button backend flow where you pump in a, a your RTL and you click a button and it generates a relatively well optimized uh, GDS two file. Of course, oh, is that, did you, did, there's a 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the discussion now about open source tools, but um, is it that um, um, the university plans that have like an open source uh, physical design tool? Would that be or? If they if they if, yeah, if, if they created magic or K layout, then yes. If if not, then no. <laughs> No, 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 it was purely open source. So yeah. Magic and K layout are both open source. Yeah, okay. but we, we didn't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, um, and finally, the approximation of gradient process means that large scale spiking neural networks are a massive pain to train. Um, but very recently, we started to address that. I won't talk about the techniques that it took, but Spike GPT, very sensationalist title, but it was the first spiking neural network that could actually do language generation. Um, and so, I mean, what did we do? We, we built a few different variants of this architecture. Um, the largest one was a 260 million parameter model, which is a hell of a lot smaller than chat GPT. But insofar as spiking neural nets are concerned, I believe it was five times larger than the previously successful trained spiking neural network. So, I mean, is bigger better? It's a separate, separate line of questioning. Um, Again, expectation management here is very important, right? Performance samples. So the 120 million model trained on the book called the data set. So what do you think of me? I asked. He was standing behind me, still looking at the posters, and I suddenly knew what he was asking. I mean, what's the spirit of this? It's it's syntactically sound, but semantically pretty weird, right? If I showed you this one or two years ago, you'd all be very impressed. But now with the advent of ChatGPT, this kind of garbled and a little bit nonsensical. But the fact is we got something that actually works with a reasonable test BPCs, which is your metric for how, uh, I guess, well your, your language is generated. Another example where we did some context, where we added some uh, domain-specific context, uh, so a bit of Q&A in the vein of chat GPT. So that was all well and good. Uh, flying forward here in the interest of time, we did break down the parallel architecture of transformers back into recurrence. That's a whole other conversation that I'm happy to dive into in a little bit more detail. Our metric for energy efficiency, because this was not run on hardware, this was done literally two weeks, three weeks ago, um, still figuring out how to compile it to Intel's Loihi. Huge, huge number of pain points there. So in the meantime, our surrogate for energy efficiency is the synaptic operation per second, which just refers to how many activate, it, it accounts for how much sparsity there is in your activation. There's a lot of potential improvements in how you benchmark that, but that's where we're at. Um, following on from that, Another mode of learning that I think was alluded to where, you know, your brain is learning across different, uh, my adversarial friend in the <laughs> was talking about how your brain is operating across very many different timescales, right? You're processing the future, you're relating back to, I don't know, 10 years in the past, something traumatic that occurred to you at some point in time, your brain can recall all of these things. So again, not going to go into too much detail here, but the idea was that we had a, we had a pair of models, a detection model and a forecasting model for some task. The example that I'm that we demonstrated this on was seizures, right? You can detect a seizure using EEG output and you can forecast a seizure 30 minutes in advance, which gives you a bit of an opportunity to guess, apply some feedback or give some warning, take some uh, anti-epileptic drugs or whatnot. Um, so the overall idea was, yeah, our detection models work pretty damn well at this point. Our forecasting models, not so well. That kind of makes sense, right? The further in time you move back and try to do something, the more challenging that, that task becomes. Um, and so what we did there was uh, we, we had some pre-trained models, won't go into the details, but then we used a detection model, or we had a forecasting model running in real time. We checked out, we checked all of its outputs. We compared and contrasted them against the detection model once the detection model caught up to the forecasting model. So as you bridge that time horizon of forecasting, the detection model would be then used. Our reliable detection model was used to update your unreliable forecasting model. So one thing that we're kind of going for here is patient-specific adaptation, right? When you have a variety of patients or with different epileptic signatures that uh, with seizures that, with, that stem in different parts of your brain, um, you then want to have uh, patient-specific models in that case, but then you don't have the money for it for a doctor to label absolutely everything that's out there. So let your detection model that's pretty robust do it for you. Um, the numbers there just indicate that there's we can go into details in a separate chat later, but in every single case, it very unsurprisingly improved performance across some determined bench uh, baseline. And we're, because of course your future detection and current detection have shared features, right? At the end of the day, you're still trying to, for, you're still trying to detect seizures. So there are going to be shared features. And so you can exploit some concurrency. So playing around with very, very 
uh, tricky simulations that I'm not sure if they're going to work in the end, but can we get 3D stacks of RAM that share weights between each other where one layer is focused on forecasting, one layer is on detection, and some of the weights could potentially be shared. How do we share those weights? Uh, those are, I guess, modeling questions of the deep learning uh, uh, abstraction. And look, finally, just uh, another thing that's, that we're kind of trying to set up with the open source tool flow is that, uh, the Telluride Neuromorphic and Cognition Workshop, where we are doing tiny neuromorphic tape out with uh, Matthew Venn from Zero to ASIC, uh, where everyone gets to uh, start off, anyone without any sort of backing in chip design can basically get a chip taped out or at least contribute to a small sliver of silicon that we'll address using some scan chain. So it's not about something that's crazily, crazily optimized by any means, but you know, you get to do some design, something high risk or whatever it is that you feel like. It could be in Verilog, could be in Chisel, it could be a uh, full custom laid out um, and basically take one of these 250 slots on a chip. So uh, myself, UCSC, Telluride, and uh, my former grad student, Pong, are going to be underwriting the cost of this. We're trying our best to uh, get this project out onto Zoom land so that it's not just constrained to the folk that are attending this workshop. So if that happens, then just keep an eye on the Telluride workshop and see, you know, basically going to train people from zero to a, a rudimentary understanding of uh, Verilog in order to actually get some, uh, some silicon back. So that's pretty cool, I think. And these are just... Uh, a 3D render of one of the previous tiny tape outs that um, Matt Venn was testing. So with that being said, of course, I have to thank the people in the team in the UCSC Neuromorphic Computing Group, uh, my students, Pong, Regia, uh, Juan, Colin, and Basil, and then undergraduate students, Farhad and Sreyas, for uh, I guess, taking charge of a lot of the work that you just saw. Um, and with that being said, happy to battle it out. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know the the original was well, not the title, but the, you know the description for this. Um, you know, today's talk. Uh, when I signed up, I, I think you talked. You, you mentioned that you'll talk about like you know, this, not emerging memory, emerging memory management application for it. Uh, I don't think I'm much of that maybe it's just my imagination. yeah that's because i had to fly through it because i was uh dealing with a very uh um conversational crowd which is honestly a lot more fun right <laughs> so i ended up not even showing there's a seizure example in that there's a spike gpt application that we're uh, trying to build but yeah i didn't go into much detail and basically so just it up. literally right now yeah in the interest of time right oh okay okay, okay. I didn't yeah i mean 720 so <laughs> yeah so uh I think the, the spike the new number comes out of like if you will like the bionic stuff. It's, it's more like the looking at the real world how the new network how far work on the neuron works. Do you actually work with or plan to work with the biologists and influencers to actually you know keep an understanding of the Yeah. Are you familiar with cortical labs? So yeah. no, so the, no, they're a startup based in Melbourne. They um they're basically taking organoids. Oh, from a, I, I want to say it's a sheep brain, and they got a very high profile, high high PR paper published in Neuron where they train this guy, this this organoid, to play the game pong. Um, they claim that you manage to learn this much faster in a much faster time than you could train an artificial neural net to with reinforcement learning in order to play pong. I, I think it's very cool. Uh, it got a lot of backlash from the neuroscience community because they used the word sentience in their paper title. Um, it got them $15 million, so good for them, but uh, yeah, a little bit of backlash there. Now, I'm not so interested in how to make these organoids play games. What I am hiring a grad student uh, in the fall for is taking these organoids and doing some meta-learning loop around them. So learning how this organoid learned to play Pong or whatever other task. And if we can adopt those, I guess, high, typically hyperparameters and use them as parameters instead in our spiking neural nets and our computational spiking neural nets, then I would hope that maybe that could give us some more insight. I'm not sure what that insight will be, but to be frank, when you work on the same thing, when you spend all of COVID lockdown working on the same Python library, SNN Torch, and then people use it, everyone starts doing the same thing in research, it gets boring. <laughs> like you've seen the same thing over and over again, and everyone kind of converges on the same KPIs. 
everyone's just trying to battle it out to get 110% accuracy in whatever whatever task it is, that gets boring. The, not many people are looking at how to actually learn from organoids, right? Um, I, I think that's a, not sure if it's a logical step, but it's an interesting step. Yeah, and- Yeah, yeah, it's plenty of room at the bottom. Fair bit of room at the top as well, I think. <laughs> Any other questions or another round of pizza? <laughs> All right, so calcium channels, let's do <laughs> Wrap it up there. Awesome. All right, well, yeah, thanks a lot.